No. Oh, 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 I know why. Now it'll work. Okay. Okay, so on this last slide, this is kind of the general picture of how well known are these pixels, which was kind of an intermediate resolution. What we did at this point was we picked some threshold. And we said, okay, anything better known than this, we're going to consider well characterized. And anything below that, we're going to consider uncharacterized. So essentially, we took this map and we made it binary. We picked a cutoff point and we said, better than this, it's well known. Okay? And right away, you can see that those well known sites are here, and then there's this. And Manaus. This, and yeah, it's, yeah, it's the city around the city, a big city. Across yeah. Amazonia and western, western Brazil. Okay? So. Uh, essentially, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the gaps. And so, start out looking here. These black pixels, you can see there are a few of them scattered here and there across the west, but then there are lots of them in the east. Those black pixels are the, the pixels that our analysis showed to be well characterized. Okay? And so geographic distance to a well-characterized pixel is easy. You can see this gap here is the Huge. biggest one. And you can see all the way around the rim of Brazil we have a lot of red. But here in the east, we really don't have any places that are geographically, spatially far from a well-characterized pixel. Okay? Now, you've got to take this and think about it in a very different way. Each one of these pixels has climatic characteristics. Okay? Annual mean temperature, annual mean annual precipitation, levels of seasonality, things like that. So imagine I plot, actually I think we used nine dimensions of climate. Okay? So I have this cloud which are all of the climates represented across Brazil. And in that cloud, each one of these pixels can be plotted. So there might be well-known climates here and there across Brazil, and here and there across the cloud of climates of Brazil, right? And so now what I'm going to do is for every single pixel across Brazil, I'm going to measure the distance in climate space to the nearest well-characterized pixel. If the pixel is well-characterized, then the distance is zero. But if it's a climate combination that's very, very, very poorly surveyed in general, then I'm going to get a long distance. That's what this map shows. So zero at the black pixels, because those are well-characterized. And you can see here in the east and southeast, you see a lot of blue. That is, she actually used the wrong mm -hmm. legend. It's long distance, short distance. Sorry about that. Um, but what this is saying, because you're seeing mostly blue in there, is that those are climates that have been sampled well somewhere in Brazil. Here, and here, and here, those are climates where none of the well-sampled pixels is close in climate space to those pixels. So there's some really interesting stuff in here. We get this same south of the Amazon River, eastern half of the Amazon Basin gaps. And then we get a lot of border stuff, okay? And we gotta be careful there because, you know, here's Colombia and Ecuador and Peru. It may well be that in Iquitos, Iquitos is where, here? I think like about, about more lower, yeah. 
phone here. Okay, thank you. So it may be that in Amazonian Peru, there's a site that's massively well sampled. And these climates are unique in a Brazilian sense, but they may have been sampled just across the border. Or here, this is on the border with Argentina. Maybe the, the Argentines. Uruguay. No, Argentina. Uruguay, Uruguay here, Argentina. Argentina here. It may be that right here in what, Misiones, there's a very well sampled set. So we have to be a little careful of this. But essentially, what we have here is a view of sampling gaps in geographic space and sampling gaps in environmental space. And then we can put them together. We didn't really know how to weight them. I couldn't tell you, well, you know, geographic space is twice as important as environmental space, so we just weighted them equally, and this is what you get. You can still see those borderland gaps, but there's the real priority. Okay, it's in the middle of Brazil. It's about as far from a border as you can get, and nobody has sampled well a site close geographically or similar climatically. Let's see. And then finally, here's that map I just showed you. There's the map that Vanderly showed you of original vegetation. And so we can put those together. It's, it's a little hard because there are a couple of things going on in there. But essentially what you see here, where you see red, like here, those are large areas of intact primary vegetation that have never been surveyed, spatially or climatically. Whereas down here you may see red, but with a lot of white, a lot of speckling in there. So down here, and what Campinas is right about here. Down here, what you're doing is you're looking for those last little bits. You know, you're essentially trying to salvage something. Whereas up here, you have the opportunity to get in and survey intact systems. Both are important, but depending on what your organization is and its objectives, you may prioritize one of those things over the other. So, just to summarize what I don't know what I'm summarizing, 34% of current Brazilian herbarium records are not yet digital, so we can make this better. Um, some institutions are digital, but not integrated, so they're not in here. This is that data leakage that we were talking about. Um, and obviously, there's the opportunity and the necessity to get out and do de novo field work. But ideally, let's do the de novo field work taking into account mm -hmm. the knowledge we already have. If I'm just picking sites, I may think, well, gosh, I've never been to Acre. Let's go to Acre, but it may not be important. Okay? So then this is, this is a little bit more policy related. This is the second paper. I don't know how long this is going to go on, but yeah. uh, nope. had a really interesting situation where a big group of Brazilian botanists got together, reviewed large swaths of the Brazilian angiosperm flora, and made lists of species that were data deficient I don't know anything about this species. Made lists of species that were threatened, that were endangered, and that were critically endangered. And then the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment did the same exercise. But it was very interesting that the Ministry of the Environment put many, many, many more species over in that data deficient category. And so of the, of the list done by the scientists, 
vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, whereas notice that of this set of really threatened species, the Minister of the Environment puts two-thirds of them as data deficient. The reason why? Speculation, but for the species that are out here in the endangered category, you have to immediately have an action plan mm -hmm. by Brazilian law. For these species, you don't have to do anything. So what we set out to do in the second paper was to ask, okay, for that set of a thousand data deficient species, or putatively data deficient species, which the scientists said were under some threat, are these species really data deficient? And so we essentially use the digital accessible knowledge to see how much do we know about that set of species that is putatively data deficient. So kind of the same data set and the same inputs. And we asked how well known not is a site but rather how well known is the distribution of a species. Okay, so we looked at not the accumulation of species at a site, but rather sites for a species. It's kind of turning the matrix on its side. Same form. And so, it's hard to look at this here. So essentially what we did, sorry, was we took our completeness index and a number of records, okay? So this is essentially how completely do I know the distribution of the species? And this is simply how many herbarium sheets are there for the species? And we outlined sectors of this space that we're pretty happy with calling well-known, okay? In this case, it was you guess that we have documented with herbarium sheets 80% of the species distribution, and we have some number of, of unique records. We'll come back to that, I suspect, but I don't know. Um, so we took, after, after that initial swath, where the completeness index was good, for this second part, those are species, she's got the shading a little bit wrong, but those are species where either you have too few records or the completeness index is low. For those, we started playing with niche model. I don't want to go into the details of it, but we, we classified our niche models as either really good, pretty good, not good, or didn't work. And so we're really focused here. <laughs> the species that are either up here in this well-known region or in this area where we were able to take a little bit of knowledge and make it into a pretty good model, those are species where I don't really think we can say data deficient. So, for example, for Dictia, Dictia rarifolia, rariflora, sorry, we've got, looks like seven points, but it outlines a pretty consistent circumscribed area. Okay, again, I don't want to go into the, the details of the methodology. But essentially, this sums up this whole setting. Here's that set of a thousand data deficient species on the Ministry of the Environment list. I'm going to throw out a few of them because they're not angiosperms. We end up with 934 species. The completeness index was quite good for 152 of those 934. Of the remaining 690, 230, we could make a really good model, which is to say we had enough information to do something useful with. And so we would argue that okay, digital accessible knowledge is available for more than half of those species, but 
41% of those data deficient species actually have a lot of data. I know there are IUCN cat, uh, qualities or, 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 or um, qual characterizations of these, of these um, categories, and maybe what we're calling not data deficient doesn't quite fit with what they're calling data deficient. But our point in this paper is simply that in this case where we have a thousand or 934 species shoved over into this garbage can of data deficient, I can't do anything with them, I don't know anything, I guess we'll have to wait for the scientists to do something. Mm -hmm. Actually, 40% of them uh, have quite a bit of information. Let's see. This is a matter of interest. What which one did you use? This was quick and dirty, so we used Maxent. Uh, that's a that's a subject for another course. Uh, there, there should be no one single best, and there is no one single best. Um, that's it. That's the other point there, and that is that uh, whenever you do English modeling, there's some, uh, there's some modeling ethics involved. And uh, whatever, however you define your, um, your, uh, your, your, your niches. Walk over next to him. Or, um, However you define your niches, your, your things are going to be extrapolated out to those niches. That's just by definition of setting up niches and believing in them. So um, I, I did some uh, modeling with the uh, first bird atlas data. And um, <coughs> our first bird atlas data, that's 7 million records. And I tried to find on the basis of the data, what I called the aviomes. So I was expecting there to be places like with plants, where lots of species come to the end of their range. And as hard as I tried, I couldn't find it. So, um, so the, the, the birds, they were, they, they were fading out and fading in, but not according to any pattern. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the confident maps that the botanists draw just don't work for birds mm -hmm. because they don't have niches like that. So, um, so as, as soon as you impose that as part of your modeling, you know, somewhere deep in the ethics of, of the modeling is you are assuming that the, that the, the, uh, the, the niches actually work. So you're assuming, oh, one might be assuming that in this case, bird species follow a particular climate combination as a major determinant of their distributions. Yes, yes, that's that's an assumption which needs to I, be no, articulated. It's, it's not an assumption. It's something that gets tested every time a niche model result is published responsibly, which is to say, each time we do this exercise, we should test that assumption. Yes, but it, is, it isn't always tested, that's oh, the reality. Yeah. No, I, I'm right with you on that. The quality and rigor with which 80 to 90 percent of the niche modeling literature is developed is pitiful. Okay? I, I always say I spent like 10 years trying to get the field moving down the tracks. And now I'm going to spend the next 10 years trying to stop it because there is so much abuse of the potential, which is, I get my occurrence data from GBIF or VertNet or wherever, I stick it in there with my world climb, uh, climate data, I press the button in Maxent, mm -hmm. and I look at the map that comes out, and I don't have to use my brain at any yeah. point in that process, yeah. and it's offensive. Yeah, yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. there's ethics involved in that. I'm right with you on that point. Um, but again, that's a subject for another course. Yeah.